Hi, welcome to the first episode of the new Libro FM podcast. This show will be about books, authors, narrators, and everything in between. If you don't know what Libro is, we sell audiobooks. But what makes us different is every time you make a purchase with us, we split that profit with your local bookstore. We currently work with over 1,700 bookstores across America and Canada, and we're working to expand our international partnership soon. Libro FM is based out of Seattle, Washington, but our team is all over America. Libro FM is also a social purpose corporation, which we'll talk about more later in the episode. On today's episode, we're going to be talking with the founders of Libro, learn about how it got started, how it grew to where it is today, and where it's going in the future. But before we get started with that, we figured we should introduce ourselves. My name's Craig. I'm a designer here at Libro. I've been with the company for about a year and a half. I mostly work on the iOS and Android apps. And I've really enjoyed my time here so far. And I'm super excited to be working on this podcast with Karen. Awesome. I am Karen Farmer. Um, I've also been at Libro FM for a little over a year now. Um, so for anyone who's listening, if you've ever reached out to us for support, there's a really good chance that we've met before um, because I work directly with our customers in customer support and through our customer success programs. Um, working here, I think like like Craig was a dream of mine for a long time. So really <laughs> excited to be a part of the team and to be doing this podcast with you, Craig. I think the dream thing's pretty accurate. I cold emailed Mark and said, can I please work here? And he said, <laughs> no, not right now. And then I emailed a year later to the day almost and said, what about now? Um, and here I am. So, you know, for those listening, you know, just just send emails. Just keep bothering CEOs of companies until they let you work there. Someday um, they'll, they'll send the good news. <laughs> yeah. I did. Well, Although Mark was very nice when he said no the first time, he did throw throw some credits in my account as a as a consolation prize. You know, like that's pretty. Sorry, sweet. we're not hiring right now, but thanks for being a member. Here's a few credits. So enjoy um, some audiobooks. Yeah. Um, so no complaints there. Um, <laughs> so I'm super excited to to hear from Mark and Nick and Carl on this on this next section here. Um, I'm sure I'll learn stuff too, um, even though I work here. So. Same. I guess without further ado, let's get into it. Yeah, let's do it. Welcome to the podcast, guys. We're super excited to have you here and hear about how Libro got started, You know what you learned along the way, where it's going. Um, but before we get started, we figured it would be good to have you tell the listeners a little bit about yourselves. So your name, what you do here at Libro, and then maybe your favorite audiobook or maybe your most recent listen, um, just so we can get to know you guys. Maybe Mark can go first. Hi, I'm Mark Pearson, one of the co-founders of Libra FM and the CEO. Uh, one of my latest favorite audiobooks is Stanley Tucci's Taste. If you love food or all things Italian, this is the audiobook for you. And I'll go ahead and go. My name is Nick Johnson. I'm the creative director and one of the co-founders here at Libro. I started a new book yesterday that I'm super excited about. It is called What Bees Want, uh, Beekeeping as Nature Intended. I am uh, a amateurish beekeeper, but uh, I love beekeeping books. We're still waiting for those photos of you with the like net and hat and the whole, oh, the whole get up. I have you some know? great ones. I have right. some great ones. I just need to share them. My, my new bees come in about three weeks. So I'm very excited. Well, nice. Congratulations. Where, where does one buy bees? Is there like a bees.com? Bees.fm? There probably is. <laughs> I happen to have um, about 10 miles from me. One of the best beekeeping associations in the state is headquartered just a little bit from me. So uh, I just called them up and I, I got my two queens coming in, uh, in late April. And I'm Carl Hartung, um, the last of the co-founders and uh, CTO uh, here at Libro. And uh, I think the last book that I really enjoyed listening to was Sapiens. What's, I don't think I know that one. What is that book about? Uh, they talk a lot about, I guess, history before there was history. Um, so it's sort of how uh, humans came about and what happened uh, as they sort of evolved over time. Uh, and it covers a lot of, uh, a lot of time between, uh, I guess, zero and when history started getting recorded. That sounds awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for um, introing all of yourselves so people know who you are and um, a little bit about what you guys do. 
yeah, thanks for making the time today. I know you all are super busy as are, you know, Karen and I as well. So it's fun that we could take a break and do this today, which is great. What we wanted to do today was hear a little bit about how Libro got started. So thinking like all the way back from the beginning, um, both Karen and I have worked here for, you know, a year, year and a half, something like that. Is that right, Karen? Um, yep. And you guys have obviously been involved since the very beginning. Um, so we were just hoping you guys could tell us about the history, how it got started, and then maybe we'll move into where it is today and where it's going to go in the future. Mark, I know you got started in the kind of like publishing world by starting your own publishing company, um, Pear Press. Um, I was thinking that maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about that, and then maybe we can go into how that sort of, you know, led you to begin Libra with these other guys. Sure. So I founded the publishing company called Pear Press, uh, which is an independent publisher with the model to do a book every couple of years, a book that has a chance to impact the world, do some good, uh, as well as the potential to be a bestseller. And so along the way, I saw that my audiobook sales uh, were increasing. And the fact is the independent bookstores had no way to participate in the growth of the audiobook business. And so uh, we had a group of us uh, who would get together from time to time uh, at a pub underneath a bookstore called Third Place Books. And uh, one of the sessions, uh, I asked to, for some time to talk about an idea, and that is to create an audiobook platform. So good things happen uh, when friends get together and uh, have a couple of beers and, and talk about business ideas. So this third place books has a bar or a pub in the basement of it or in the ground level or whatever. Exactly. Nice. Is it still there to this day? Oh, it is. Yes. Nice. It is. To, I uh, just, I just got to see it for the first time a month or so ago and it, it lived up to the expectations that were set. <laughs> <laughs> When you were first starting to get the publishing company off the ground, like what what did that look like? I, I, I know nothing about starting a publishing company. Like for me, I'd be like, I guess I'll just print it. You know what I mean? So like, what what is that process like? So like most books, it starts with an idea and an author who's uh, passionate about it, that they want to see this book uh, get out there. And for me, uh, it was an experience I had studying art history in Rome where I came back with a lot of stories and uh, realized that there was no book that captured that experience of backpacking around Europe or studying abroad. So I decided to uh, forego a business consulting job and uh, start uh, my publishing company from scratch and uh, publish this book. So I learned about publishing from the ground up and I loved everything about it. I love uh, the marketing aspect uh, and also, uh, I spoke uh, at about 30 independent bookstores around the country. So I got to meet these wonderful booksellers firsthand and, and learn about their important role in curating uh, books. So you self-published your own first book and then were like, I could do that again for other authors. Is exactly. That, I yeah. figured that, you know, worst case is uh, the whole, the book would fail and then I go and get a real job. Um, but I've never had to get a real job. I still <laughs> feel uh, so, uh, yeah. Then I just, uh, kept doing, uh, one book at a time. Um, and that has led us to Libra FM. One thing I think we should probably mention for the listeners out there is that, uh, Carl and Mark and I were all friends prior to Libro and we went to college together at the university of Washington. And the funny story about that book that Mark's talking about is actually a turned into a series, uh, Europe from a Backpack and Italy from a Backpack and whatnot. Um, those books, uh, pictures of my own travels are actually on the cover and the back cover and whatnot of those books. So I always get a kick when I see them in stores and I could see myself like leaning into a, uh, into a fountain in Trevi Square and whatnot. It's pretty fun. That's, That's so awesome. cool. I did not know that. One of the things you mentioned, Mark, um, you know, is the the enjoyment of meeting with all of these booksellers throughout the process. And um, obviously one of the things that makes Libro FM so special are all of our partnerships with independent bookstores. And um, I've often wondered about the early days when this was getting started, how the three of you made these connections with bookstores and got them to, to go on the journey. Um, now we have over 1700. Um, so we're doing really well and it's growing, but in the early days, it seems like that might've been challenging to get rolling. 
you know, the origin of Libra FM was at a bookstore, uh, Third Place Books in Seattle. And it started there in talking with uh, Robert Sindelar, who is the manager. Uh, and then from there, we asked other booksellers that we knew, you know, imagine if there was an audiobook platform that you could sell audiobooks on. And we spent a good full two years uh, just talking with booksellers to understand what is it that they would want. Um, Nick uh, did all sorts of prototypes and we had meetings through the American Bookseller Association uh, with booksellers uh, to really like listen to them. And that hasn't changed from when we started the company eight years ago. We work with now 9,000 booksellers across 1,600 bookstores. Uh, and we're always listening to them of like, what's working well, what can we do better? Um, but that was the beginning. It was funny in those first meetings with bookstores, we go, Mark and I would go to trade shows and, you know, no one knew us. We were these young guys with this crazy idea and people were gracious enough to actually talk to us and give us some time because booksellers are fantastic people. And then the next year people would know us a little bit more and the idea would be more refined and so on and so forth. And it was really fun to kind of watch it grow year after year and stores get more and more excited. And I think for the stores, what was really exciting for them is every year we'd come back with a better variation of what they had asked for the year before. And so I think a lot of stores really felt like they had a lot of ownership in what Libra FM became in the system that we built. You mentioned that you had some kind of early conversations before you were even building anything necessarily to try to like pick the brains of booksellers about audiobooks and what they would want from a platform like this. What were those conversations like? Like what were you hearing from bookstores in terms of if you're going to go build this thing, this is what we would want it to do and all that? I think one of the things that was pretty consistent feedback from stores is they wanted it to be easy. Um, there, most stores aren't very techy and, or even if they are, they don't want to spend a lot of time on tech. They would much rather spend their time talking to their customers and curating books and things of that nature. Um, I remember one of those trade shows, I think we had five different concepts on how the platform could function and how it could work. And pretty much universally, every store chose the same concept, which is what we ended up building, which is a kind of a white label version of a website that they could direct people to that the stores didn't have to invest time and money to start and they didn't have to put a ton of energy into keeping it maintained. And, you know, that that was kind of consistent through line. You said it started at third place books, but were they like the first store on the platform too or no? I believe the first store technically able to sell um, books through us was Eagle Harbor Books on Bainbridge Island, uh, just outside of Seattle, just across the water. They were the first and then Liberty Bay Books, which is only about 10 miles from there and just down the street from me, uh, followed about half a day later. (laughs) Did it become easier to get people to sign up when you could say these other bookstores are on here? Like, was it harder initially versus, you know, a year in or two years in? I wouldn't say it was hard ever. I think, you know, there's such little barrier for entry for stores to participate. Um, I do think some stores were kind of wanting to wait it out and just see what happened with it, or they're just very, very busy. But um, I don't think we really ever had a whole lot of difficulty getting stores to sign up and join. And it's definitely gotten easier as time has gone on because all bookstores talk to each other. And luckily they say very good things about us. And so it uh, kind of grows itself. What did the... I guess like audiobook landscape, look at that time. Obviously, it's pretty different now. I mean, I know just from my own research that there's a bunch of different audiobook companies um, all offering slightly different things. And But at the time, um, you know, eight years ago when you were thinking this up over beers in a basement, what, it, what did like the landscape look like at that time? Well, first, uh, does anybody remember uh, compact disc and uh, cassettes? <laughs> I do. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So when, when we started, uh, I believe still is about 50% of audiobooks were sold on uh, CDs, right? And now when we look back, that's hard to believe there was a time uh, when we were putting CDs in our car as we were driving down the highway. Uh, but that was the state. And so the audiobook business has been growing ever since by double digit uh, because it's just so easy now to listen um, on the go uh, through our app. So in the very beginning, it was just the three of you. Is that accurate or no? Like in the the very early days or I'm seeing some shaking of heads. Yeah, yeah, it it wasn't quite. I wasn't at that initial meeting. Um, There was another co-founder, Yao, who was there. 
And then I came on pretty soon thereafter, but it was really Carl and Mark and Yao who started it. And then I was kind of a fast follow. And when, when we, when we say started, I think that's kind of a, a little <laughs> bit of a loose term because we were all actually working, uh, full-time jobs, uh, doing other things, uh, especially like while a lot of this research that, uh, Mark and Nick were going and talking to bookstores and we weren't really building anything. So it was, uh, kind of a, a, a pet project for, I'd say the first year or so where we were doing more, expl- uh, more, uh, exploration, uh, and kind of ideas than we were actually building things. And it wasn't until uh, a couple of years later where we started kind of, uh, prototyping and then actually, you know, getting publishers on board, uh, and getting content on the site, uh, that it really started to, uh, become a you know full-time job for all of us what did building the team initially look like um like i said you know karen and i've only been here for a year and change but like initially it was you know three or four people it was kind of prototype world like obviously you left your full-time jobs at some point um unless you're still working there carl so what did that look like going from like three or four guys with like kind of a pet project to being like this is a real thing and we need to start hiring people to, to grow this? So we've always been really deliberate from the beginning about how we're building our company. And uh, we're very fortunate with the three of us, the skills that we bring. Uh, my business background as a publisher, uh, Nick's a long history in design and creative director. And of course, Carl uh, as a, you know, has a PhD in computer science, right? So we were really set up for success in that we didn't have to raise any money. Uh, Libra FM is built from scratch. We have no outside investors. We're all employee owned. So we built the business with the long term in mind, uh, which also has meant it's taken us some more time to get to where we are. We're eight years into this. Um, But, you know, we've had momentum every year. And then as we have grown, we've um, been able to add on uh, more engineers and um, marketing and product roles as well. And I think the initial growth of the team uh, was a lot of serendipity. Uh, it was you know people we knew, friends of ours that heard what we were doing, and uh, at different times they were moving or they were changing jobs for different reasons. And they're like, "Hey, you need help with that?" And uh, so that was kind of the I'd say the first three or four people kind of came came on board. Uh, via just conversations, really. And when we started, it was it was interesting because it wasn't like any of us had full time jobs working for someone else that we had to like full on quit. We all had full time jobs working for ourselves, so we were all kind of self employed. And so as Libro ramped up over a course of a couple of years, we all kind of ramped down our own you know self employed businesses uh, at whatever schedule worked best for us and best for what the needs for Libra were at that time. So it allowed us to kind of smooth that transition as opposed to making a really abrupt life change and quitting a job or something of that nature. It's something folks might not know that are listening. So we're a fully remote company and we've got employees all over the U.S. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how you all made the decision to have the remote model and then sidebar question, um, mm-hmm. how do you guys keep the culture of the company alive um, with everybody distributed? From the beginning, we've thought of ourselves as a coffee shop based business that we early on said we're never going to have an office. Uh, so we started meeting uh, weekly at a, a coffee shop in Seattle called Millstead Coffee. They have the best coffee and a great spot to work. And that's where uh, we would get together and, and use the internet and drink coffee. Um, so that's pretty central to us is to be a fully distributed company. Um, and now uh, we are able to find the best around the country, uh, but certainly it has been challenging with the pandemic uh, because we have not been able to, to see one another in person. Uh, but fortunately that's all going to change. Uh, soon we'll, we'll all get together for the first time as a company. Hopefully it doesn't get moved for a third time, you know? (laughs) (laughs) One thing that, um, other than the uh, commercial for Milstead there, which is a fantastic coffee company, um, the initial team was pretty much all based in the Seattle area. So even though we were distributed without a central office, we were able to get together and meet quite often. Um, And the culture was pretty 
kind of baked into the company at that point, because we all did know each other in one way or another, or new members of the team knew someone else or so on and so forth. It has been um, more challenging as we've gotten bigger and we've, you know, employees are now based all around the, the country. And the fact that a lot of our employees now didn't know us beforehand, you know, we're, we're bringing in people who have no familiarity with us. So we're having to be a lot more um, strategic, I guess, with the, or, with the culture building, or at least more um, straightforward with it. And instead of it just being kind of baked into our personalities, really kind of showcasing, hey, this is the sort of company we want to build. This is really what we value as a company. And as founders, we need to show that we need to show that we really, you know, it's not just talk, we really do value um, members of the team having ownership over their specific, you know, whatever the responsibilities are and all of that sort of stuff. And so that's definitely, at least for me, been a learning curve of, you know, making sure I'm really, really um, apparent about, you know, believing what we, what we preach that we believe and showing our employees, uh, you know, that it's, that's not just, um, you know, words that we're putting out there, so on and so forth. I want to move into the kind of growth period of Libro. So we just talked a lot about how it, you know, how it started and, you know, it was a really small operation, even a pet project in the beginning, et cetera. But before we kind of go into that, how you took it from that into moving into a larger business, I was just curious if you had any advice or tips for anyone like in the like stuff you wish you knew when you were starting the business or, or maybe if you don't have tips, but like something you learned that was like, man, I wish we didn't do that. Or that was really hard or, you know, mistakes or <laughs> things like that. I feel like Carl can probably talk for an hour on different technical <laughs> things that fall into that category. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely lear a lot of learning experience things, you know, like Mark said at the beginning, um, when we started, there was still a lot of CDs being sold and, and apps weren't, apps were sort of like becoming uh, a, a popular thing. So we actually built a website first um, and we didn't really focus on the apps and so, uh, we were a little behind, I think, on that. And I think if I was going to do it again, I would either start with the apps or uh, make sure that they were uh, being built uh, in tandem with the website so that all the functionality was available across all platforms. Because uh, we definitely had, uh, and even in some cases still do, have functionality on the website that uh, people are clamoring for in the apps. And and we're, we're working as hard as we can to uh, have the apps catch up. Uh, but we're, that was kind of like the, 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 the big thing that I think... Uh, if I was going to go back and do it again, I'd focus on the apps sooner. So yeah, I kind of wanted to switch into the the what I what I haven't written in my script is the the growth period here. So um, you know, super interesting to learn about when it was small and kind of scrappy, but obviously now we're you know there's a lot more employees. There, like like Karen said, it's spread out across the U.S. We went from you know this was the first store, that was the second store, and now it's 1,700 stores. Um, and I'm guessing. It, I know Libro's never spent like a ton on marketing or at least like traditional marketing, you know, and we're not like hammering people with Instagram ads or, you know, this and that. So I guess I'm just curious, like, how did you do that? <laughs> like, um, like, how did it go from something so small to so big? I mean, I know word of mouth is a big one. And, you know, you mentioned going to book conferences and all that, but I, I would just be curious if you could speak to that a bit. Building the relationship with bookstores and really getting them to know who we are and know what we're about. Um, because the, the bookstores really are, you know, a huge marketing team for us. They're the ones who have the rela relationships in their communities and with their customers and whatnot. And it's one thing for them to be able to say, hey, yeah, you can get audiobooks through this random company. But it's another thing for them to say, hey, you can get audiobooks through Libra FM. They're awesome. I know Mark, I know Nick, I know Carl, they really are trying to help us out, you know, that was really how I think we grew initially was building really, really strong relationships with bookstores and booksellers, and then having them spread the word to their customer base and on, you know, in person, online, so on and so forth. Um, that was kind of the, I think, initial growth period. And we've always had this, and Mark has said it many times, this kind of marathon, not sprint approach, where our goal was to grow slow and steady and not this kind of sprint and then fizzle, which happens to a lot of companies, which I think we've done a pretty good job of doing that. Though we did get into a little bit of a sprint, as Carl mentioned, with the pandemic, that's certainly um, a lot, 
lot more people started listening to audiobooks, started supporting their bookstores online. And so unlike a lot of businesses in 2020 that really suffered, we were the complete opposite. We were just going like gangbusters there. And it was, uh, it was crazy for a while. And th- during that time, that was kind of when some major growth in terms of employee count happened too, right? Yeah, definitely. That, right, right when that happened, basically doubled the size of our company. And then even temporarily, I know when a lot of the bookstores closed, I think we hired about 10 or 11 booksellers who were recently out of work um, and, and basically gave them work for a few months uh, to help us deal with the, the quick growth and to help them when they were you know, temporarily laid off. I think the relationship with the bookstores thing is absolutely true. And I've noticed it too. Like, um, I think I told you guys this, but I was recently in New Orleans and saw a Libra poster up on the wall. And I was like, oh, Libra, like I work there. And they were immediately, you're like, we know this person, that person. We want to talk about Libra for the next half an hour, you know, so, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, It doesn't happen often where you're like, oh, I like your register. And they, talk like you know how much they love their register company so it's it's really nice to have that relationship and um shout out blue cypress books i think i've mentioned before to to some of uh some of the people here um that's my mom's favorite thing about traveling now is wherever <laughs> she's traveling she finds a bookstore and then she kind of slyly asks them about audiobooks <laughs> Um, you know, if they mention Libra, which most stores do now, she'll be like, oh, well, that, that's my son. And like nine times out of 10, the booksellers, uh, they obviously know of Libra, but nine times out of 10, they actually know me personally from a show or something like that. And she just starts glowing with pride. And it's, it's then she immediately calls me up and she was like, oh, I was at so-and-so <laughs> bookstore and they know you. And yeah, it's really fun. Incredibly charming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you mentioned that there was like a shift in the last couple of years for a sad reason, but you know, it is what it is and it was good for Libro. But in the early stages, you know, like the first couple of years, was there ever a moment that felt like a, like a big shift for the business, whether it was when you launched the apps, like Carl mentioned was like a big, you know, a big deal. Or was there ever a moment that felt like a big, like what was like the first like big, you know, peak or whatever mm-hmm. for Libro, I guess. I think from the tech side, definitely the apps, each of the apps launches were really big things. I think launching a membership program was huge. Mm-hmm. Um, letting people subscribe and have them, you know, get a credit and be able to buy a book every month. Um, uh, that was a, a really big uh, moment for us. Was Libro initially only like a la carte purchases? Yep. Oh, no, I didn't know that. that. Yeah. Yeah. How long ago did you switch from that? Mo- not. I know you can still buy books a la carte on the website, but how long ago did you switch from that being the primary to being, you know, a a somewhat secondary. I think we launched the membership program in spring of 2017. So five years. Yeah, there's definitely been some technical milestones um, that are kind of like, I definitely remember they're they're like a flag in the sand sort of thing. Um, I remember I used to get so excited when someone would tweet about us, someone, (laughs) you know, uh, a celebrity, a, you know, it's like, oh, the, I don't want to say C-list celebrity, but maybe a lesser known celebrity. I'd be like, oh, great. And then maybe a B-list celebrity. I'd be like, awesome. And then it's like an A-list celebrity. And I'd be like, what? And now it's kind of commonplace. But when it used to happen, I'd be like, oh, my gosh. And I'd you know, text my friends and be like, so-and-so tweeted us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, co- a company I worked I worked at earlier in my career, we would, we would give t-shirts with our logos as like a freebie or whatever and anytime i would see one out in the wild i'd be you know it was like like oh my god like that's a t-shirt you know <laughs> um it's a, a good feeling for sure so you talked a little bit about like the kind of tech milestones that were a big deal for the company were there ever i mean i know there are but were there ever any like personal milestones or things that felt really um you know rewarding about libra right whether it was like helping the bookstores or you know going into the community like like I guess I would just like to know like what's been the most like rewarding part in the last like eight years. I think there's been some neat things we've been able to do as a social purposes corporation that other companies maybe don't have the, uh, maybe they have the ability to do, but. Um, can you, you know, can we, you take a second and explain what that is? I assume not everyone will know what a, a social purpose corporation is. Mark, I'll let you do that one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a social purpose corporation is similar to a B Corp, uh, but the difference is that it's a uh, state uh, classification. Uh, so we happen to be uh, based in Washington state officially, 
Uh, and that is a designation that uh, we have um, signed up for, uh, which requires us to have a social purpose and to uh, have a, a report every year on our website about what we did that year for our social purpose. And so uh, it really has just is a good fit for us because from the beginning of the company, we've always been about uh, our mission to support local bookstores and to get more people uh, you know, listening to books. Um, but this is a way that we're held accountable uh, for what we do. So we've been able to do some really neat things uh, over the years um, that aren't necessarily profitable, uh, but it's the right thing to do and advances our mission. What are like, um, like what's a good example of one of those things? I know, I know listeners could go to the website, scroll down to the footer, <laughs> find the social report page, but if there's any like particular thing you're super proud of or glad that the company did, is there a... There's so many. Uh, one cool story uh, is uh, there's an organization called Bink that raises money to help booksellers in need. And actually, Nick, you can talk about, but the, came up with the idea uh, to uh, have artists uh, design socks and uh, sell them and then donate all the profit uh, to Bink. Yeah, that was, um, so that was part of what we did in 2020, which, you know, back to your um, original question of what are the most rewarding moments um, for me, basically all of 2020 was one of the most rewarding moments for me. um, Because as I mentioned before, 2020 was such a difficult year for so many people, so many people and so many businesses, but it was a really, really good year for us. So it was this weird kind of feeling of being really happy that we're doing well, but also feeling almost a little bit guilty that, you know, other people were suffering so much. And so, you know, we put out our social purpose report for 2020 and that report itself, I'm so um, thankful for, and just, it's so rewarding because we did so much that year. I mean, just tons and tons of things. The thing that Mark specifically is talking about is this fundraiser we did for Bink, where we teamed up with a bunch of artists to create custom um, socks. And then all the proceeds of those sock sales went to um, to support Bink, which supports uh, booksellers in need. And the really kind of fun thing about that is I was working on the program and my daughter, who is 13 now, but was 11 at the time, um, saw what I was doing and said, hey, I'd like to design a pair of socks. Can I get involved in that? And I was like, sure. I was like, but they have to be, you know, have to be good. I I like, I love you and all, but they they need to be, you know, we have, we have professional artists in here. These can't just be any old socks. And so, you know, to her credit, she put in a ton of effort and then, you know, obviously I helped her out and whatnot. And we're like, okay, maybe she'll sell, you know, a hundred socks or 150 socks or something like that. So I think she ended up, um, I think she ended up selling about 1,100 socks total. Okay. She was actually covered uh, by the Washington Post in their <laughs> newsletter. They covered her uh, and shared a photo of her and her sock design. And I think altogether that program sold just shy of 4,000 pairs of socks and raised like $30,000 for Bink. Um, and that was just that was just fun. That was amazing that whole year, but specifically that campaign. And being able to have my daughter involved in it was was just so much fun. That's awesome. I love that story. And I think we have those socks as well. I see them all the time around my house. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. So now that we've kind of talked about the how the company got started and then kind of like how you went from like a super small company to where it is today, I was kind of thinking we could talk about kind of what you think the next couple of years look like. Um, I obviously know a little bit around like where our roadmap and our goals are for the next years, but um, I would be curious to know from you, um, like, where do you see, like, what's the next big thing for Libro? You know, it was the app originally, and then it was, you know, growing the business, et cetera. Like, what do you think the next few years look like for Libro without giving away any trade secrets, of course, you know? <laughs> I think the biggest thing is to be able to support more stores outside of the U.S. and Canada. Um, and that's kind of the uh, expansion plan that we have to, you know, first move into the UK uh, and then Europe and Australia and New Zealand and uh, just make it so that we can uh, help out stores worldwide. I think our, our product line, if you will, is pretty good now. Our apps are pretty good. We'll, you know, obviously continue to make them better and 
uh, bring the Android app and introduce some new functionality like Apple Watch and things of that nature. But I think the product it, itself is pretty solid. Just giving more bookstores the ability to participate, mainly international stores, and they're clamoring for it. I mean, we've been discussing uh, Libra FM with international stores for years now, and they've been begging for it. And uh, uh, that was one unfortunate about the um, the pandemic was it kind of delayed a lot of that timing. But we're coming out of it now, and we'll be, um, you know, in some of these international markets soon. And I think that's kind of for me that's what success is: is just giving more independent bookstores the ability to compete and to grow and to survive and helping them survive and thrive. Um, that's what I'm really excited for. Plus now when your mom travels, she can glow about you in other countries too, you know, not just America. <laughs> yeah. She could, you know, depending on where it is, maybe struggle with the language, but see, you know, <laughs> get, get across the excitement. I will, uh, I'll throw something out there on behalf of our customers and, you know, you don't have to answer this, but we do get many people that, love Libro FM. They love the business model and would love to be able to support independent bookstores with ebook purchases. Um, I'm sure this is not the, <laughs> the first time this has come up for you all. Um, is that something that the company is interested in? <laughs> I think we have a lot of work on the audiobook side before we can go to ebooks, uh, but certainly uh, our book selling partners and customers have re you know requested that for many years. Um, and I think one of the the best things we can do in the, in the uh, future as well, though, is just help our customers discover an, another great book in partnership with our booksellers. I mean, the, the curation aspect is core of our independent bookstore partners and who we are. Mm -hmm. So that's a big priority for us because uh, there's 250,000 audiobooks in our catalog. And so we want to make it better uh, to, to open your app or the website and find that next great audiobook. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think, uh, kind of piggybacking on what Mark said there, um, one of the things that I'm really proud of as a company is that we have never been focused on selling audiobooks. We've always been focused on supporting independent bookstores. Obviously, if you want to buy an audiobook and support a store, you should do it through us. That's our hope. But we want our customers to support independent bookstores. Um, if they're going to buy a print book, go buy it from the independent bookstore. If they're going to buy an ebook, go buy it through the independent bookstore. You know, that's really what our goal is. Even on our website, we link back to the physical print book for, through the stores and whatnot. And that's that's our goal is to just really support stores in any way we can, um, be it through audiobooks, be it by just raising awareness for different print titles and so on and so forth. One other question I had for you all. So as you think about what happens next, what are the the questions or the things that are puzzling you, the things that that keep you up at night and the 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 challenges you're currently trying to solve for? I think probably for Carl, it, it's uh, tech tech issues. There's always there's always a lots of tech challenges. I know for myself, it's just larger industry questions. You know, there's a lot of big players in this game. There's obviously Amazon's Audible. Um, you know, there's Facebook, there's Google, there's Apple. There's a lot of big. Um, there's a lot of Goliaths. And where David, and you know that's just, you know something that is something that scares me is you know can we can we compete with these big companies? I mean we have a, a niche and we have a very very loyal following that I'm super thankful for, and uh, I hope that we can you know continue and that independent bookstores can continue. Um, I have a lot of reason to be hopeful because I think people have predicted the downfall of independent bookstores for the last thirty years. You know, when Borders came out and Barnes and Noble, and that never happened, and independent bookstores are doing better than ever. Um, you know, and that's because people want to support them, and they're they're more than just a bookstore. You know, they they are a staple in their whatever community they're in, and I feel like we can be the digital version of that. And that's my hope. Yeah, and I think sort of trying to find new ways to connect the our our customers with the actual bookstores, and and keeping that sort of you know local bookstore feeling. Yeah, just like keeping that feeling of like shopping at your local bookstore um, and participating in in your local community, um, and uh, it's it's hard to do that through tech sometimes, and you're not actually like physically in the store. So, uh, you know, basically, I think that one of the challenges that we're trying to uh, solve is like how do we maintain that personal connection uh, to the people who are uh, you know actually in the stores. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree as a you know, design person here who's working on new features all the time. I mean, I love working on, you know, the Apple Watch or dark mode, but the the 
features or or new stuff that I work on that's the most exciting is, you know, how do we make the experience for our members feel more like their bookstore? How do we get bookstore recommendations and all that type of stuff in front of people and make that connection stronger? It, it tends to be the work that's the most exciting and rewarding for me. And it's the stuff I know that our members really want and our bookseller partners really want as well. So I'm um, really excited in the next X amount of time to to do more do more work like that. It's a really interesting challenge as a, a designer and as a visual person where in most companies, you're really trying to emphasize your brand and your brand awareness and you know front and center, where to a certain extent, we're actually trying to de-emphasize our brand and emphasize the individual store's brand. You know, if a customer comes to our site, and, you know, it feels like their store down the street, and they see a bookseller that they know in person, and they see a recommendation or a pick from that bookseller. Um, and they see a list of staff picks that matches the staff picks of the window of their store. You know, that's what we want. That's what we want to have happen, which is, you know, interesting, because like I said, it's, it's the reverse of what you would expect. It's de-emphasizing ourselves and emphasizing these bookstores and um, allowing them to have more ability to kind of control that experience and have Libro, you know, be their voice and be true to their voice, depending on, you know, who they are, what environment they're in, what type of books they want to focus on, what sort of people they want to reach, so on and so forth. Awesome. I mean, that's all the questions I had, unless you have any more, Karen, but I just wanted to say thanks for making the time and being our inaugural podcast episode guest. This was great. I learned so much today. This was really, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really <me> interesting. Too. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for listening to our first episode. We'll be putting these out every month or so to get started. And you can expect things like interviews with authors, conversations with narrators, book news, all of that good stuff. If you have any ideas or suggestions for the podcast, we would love to hear them. Um, let us know who you want us to interview. Send us your feedback. You can get in touch with us at hello at Libro.fm. And we wanted to end the podcast with a special offer. So if you've never used Libro before, you can get a free audiobook when you use the promo code Libro Podcast. So that's it for now. And we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks for listening.